What's good, everyone? Welcome to On Another Note podcast, episode 13. This is your homegirl, On. I will be your host, clearly, because there's nobody else here. But for this podcast, I want it to be a space where I share a lot of things that are interesting, in my opinion, that goes on in my brain all the time, but it's with the goal of self-development in mind. There's a lot of lessons I've learned. With that comes a lot of wisdom I've gained. So hopefully what I share on this platform helps somebody out there and help them be like, hmm, she's got a point. There are some things that I can apply to my life that will just make me a better person overall. And I think that's what we're here to do together. So I hope that you enjoy. I wanted to do a philosophical Q&A for this episode because a couple episodes I did one and I was like, dude, that was fun. We're going to run it back today. So let's get into it, shall we? Also, I want to mention that setting up the pod I used to have my microphone in hand, but every time I would bump the cord that it's attached to, it would make like this thumping sound. And I was like, bro, that ain't it. I need to have something in my hands. So I looked over to my bed, saw the squishmallow. It was like, all right, let me squish you. And now I think I have a better understanding of why the squishmallowers are so into squishing. <laughs> Because sometimes you just feel uncomfortable and having something like this in your hand that you squish, it's kind of making all the difference. So, mm-hmm. yeah, all right, they're on to something. I think I'm starting to get it. I feel a lot more comfortable, you know, like I don't have something in my hand. I can't just sit here in my chair and be like, uh, I'm a robot. Yeah. <laughs> You got to grow up on something sometimes, you know what I'm saying? All right. Anyways, now that I'm comfortable, let's get started. First question. I was kind of surprised when I came around this question because I was like, oh, I don't think that this gets discussed that much. And it's, when is the best time to say I love you? Ooh, I know what love's just like such a common denominator that we all have. And I can't help but talk about it, you know? When's the best time to say I love you? I think, I think the best time to say I love you is when, oh, sounds cliche, but of course you gotta get to know each other when you meet a person that you're interested in. <laughs> but yeah, you get to know this person that you supposedly love inside and out. And they've gotten to the point where they're pretty damn comfortable being themselves around you. You know, like in the beginning, it's so hard to figure out a person. That's why I'm like a little cringe when I say get to know them because everybody seems so polished in the beginning. Like they're not, they're not going to fart around you. They're not going to be doing anything that they think is embarrassing around you. But you got to, you know... Take away those layers as time goes on. So yeah, you love them inside and out. They're comfortable being themselves around you. And on top of that, you're also excited about the person that they're becoming. And I say that just because in life, we change as people. I think we're supposed to change as people. If not, then we got some work to do. When you come to, into acceptance of this person is going to change and you're going to be that supportive partner that's going to be there for them no matter what. You know, that that's a really good sign. Um, you have an understanding of what you like about them, but also more importantly, their quote unquote flaws. Like, I don't think that you're supposed to like everything about a person. There's probably things that they do, like it's probably minor, but there's just ways that they act, things that they do and other aspects that you don't necessarily love but considering all of those things and at the end of the day you're like wow overwhelmed by how beautiful they are as a whole person then I think that that would be a great time to tell them that you love them yeah a lot of things to consider but I guess that's why saying I love you is that important or say it whenever you want because 
why do we, I don't know, I do question, why do we put so much emphasis on telling the other person that you love them? We, if we don't put that much meaning behind it and just say that you love them and that's that, I think that that's perfectly fine too. You know, from my experience, I can't tell you that there was like a buildup to my last partner saying that he loves me. I think that I heard it every now and then. And I don't know. I, I See, I can't even give you um, a precise idea of how that went down because I don't remember. And that's probably because everything else represented the fact that he loved me, the fact that we moved in together, the fact that we do a lot of things and laugh with each other. Like, I think that that was our way of showing each other love. And it outweighs actually saying, like, I love you for X, Y, and Z. It was the actions that actually represented I love you in that relationship. So yeah, you don't have to put as much emphasis into it as it seems like. Like, it has a lot of weight, but you know, each couple's different. All right, on to the next question. Question number two. How do you properly say goodbye to someone who has died? I know it got dark real quick, but <laughs> I can't help it. It's just because I've had a death in my life recently and it's really impacted me on a daily basis. So I wanted to discuss it further. Basically, my grandma has always lived in the same household as me. I live in a multi-generational home and it was weird when, you know, there's this person that I always came home to and all of a sudden they're not there anymore and they won't be there anymore. And that was hard for my mind to get a hold of. I would also fix this question a little bit because it's like, how do you properly say goodbye to someone? But there's so many ways to grieve that they can all be equally proper. You know what I'm saying? So let's, let's take that word out. Just because they're not there physically doesn't mean that they're not there spiritually. I know, I know I would go there, but that's just how I cope with the situation. Like when it comes to our physical reality, there are limitations in a way. For example, like to interact with this person, you gotta hit them up, you gotta give them a call, you gotta drive to come see them and able to have a conversation with them. But when it comes to death, the effort that you have to put in to be with a person, it gets eliminated because they're now in a place where they have superpowers, in my opinion, and unable to talk to them, all you have to do is just hit them up. Like literally, I turn my head sometimes and I'm like, hey grandma, what's up? And boom, she's instantaneously right there. Anywhere I am, no matter who I'm with, what I'm doing, it doesn't matter. I can just turn my head and be like, Benoit. That's how we say grandma in Vietnamese. I was like, I'm like, Benoit, like, what's up? And then she's literally right there saying what's up back. <laughs> That's how I think that she has superpowers because she can like teleport. And I think that's really beautiful in its own way. You know, like she's always going to be there for me. And that's how I move on with life. Just knowing that she's never left me. Like she'll always be there whenever she wants. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of beauty in that. Hopefully that makes sense. But like, that's how I treat death. I pretend, but not really just because it's still real for me but they're still around and I don't have to see them I don't have to hear them she's just gonna be there with me in my heart for as long as I want I travel for work right I'd be in different cities and something that I've noticed was a little butterfly there was this monarch butterfly it was yellow to be specific I would walk around outside because I work outside and I have to do a lot of walking. This butterfly would like hover around me. It would just like fly, land a little bit, but it would fly around me for at least like half an hour. And I'm just there just noticing it like, bro. Also at the time, I actually needed a little bit more guidance in my life just because mentally 
I was down bad. And just seeing that butterfly, missing my grandma, but also making that connection that like she's there to support me and she understands made all the difference. So to sum up the question of how I would say goodbye to somebody who has died is just to treat them like they're still around. There's different things that you can do just talking to them like you're talking to an imaginary friend. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but accepting their new form of life in a spiritual way is really helpful in my opinion to just have them there, not physically, but for sure in your heart. Question number trois. That's me in French. <laughs> Do we love ourselves more in the virtual world and less in the real world? Sometimes. Sometimes I could see people loving themselves more in the virtual world. That's because I look at social media and how much it's influenced our modern society for the most part. Like, if you're a millennial or Gen Z, probably social media is incorporated into your life like one way or another. Not everybody, but a good amount in my opinion. So when it comes to posting, we can affiliate our, our love for ourselves with how frequent we're posting online, like on our social media. For example, like if you're constantly posting these polished photos of yourself that's super curated and is supposed to convey this message like I have this perfect lifestyle and on top of that people believe that it's an accurate representation of your life that could very well lead to the possibility of you liking your online life better than your real life. There's just so much validation that goes into it on a psychological level because something that we made, like a picture that we took, we made that ourselves. And on top of that, everyone seems to like it because they're, you know, they're literally liking it and commenting on it. And also that cycle and that cycle in itself is like hella rewarding. It can be addicting to the point where we love ourselves online more than what goes on in normal everyday life. Like real life is multifaceted depending on how you're feeling i feel like you're supposed to have a range of emotions you can feel great one day but feel like shit the other day and when it comes to online life like people don't really show the bad parts of their life so when you're loving yourself online more than what's actually portrayed i think that that could be like super dangerous and at the same time, I do encourage for those who aren't very, aren't, who aren't particularly happy with the stuff going on in their real life to dig a little deeper, search a little harder on little things that can add up to make you love your real life. You know, coming into acceptance of the quote unquote bad days is really going to help you in the long run because you become more used to it. And the trend is that you normally get out of it, like the stock market and how it bounces back so far, <laughs> you'll bounce back from it. The more that you get used to that, the better that you'll be able to handle it next time it comes. So there's a lot of beauty into loving yourself in real life, as opposed to what you instantly get online. And yeah, so it's possible to love your virtual life, but you'll get more out of loving your real life. Final answer. On to the next question. Number four. If you had five years left to live, how would you live differently? I kind of just spat. Whoops. Eh. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, how would I live it differently? I would break this down into chunks. So for the first two years, I'd probably just continue living normally as if having the routine of waking up, getting ready for my job, working out, eating good, and repeat, right? So I would continue working, but the only difference is that I'd probably take a trip on a quarterly basis. So I've just arranged for plans to go with my family most likely, or friends if they're down, 
to take a trip somewhere, somewhere in the States, go to Canada, I don't know, but that will be more frequent, like on a quarterly basis. And yeah, check out places that we've never been to before. I think that would be super fun for the first couple of years. And then year number three, I want to hit up a lot of music festivals. Because I said in the last episode that like, she loves to rave. She loves to dance. Music is hmm, probably like the number two most important thing in her life. So yeah, year number three is going to be a whole checklist of music festivals that I'm going to be hitting up. I made a list too. So starting off, I'm going to hit up Ultra Music Festival. That's around like spring break time in March. That's going to be in Miami. So I'll see you there. (laughs) Next up, I haven't been to EDC Vegas before. I've been to EDC Orlando. EDC stands for Electric Daisy Carnival. And yeah, so I'll see you in Vegas in May. Next, I have to, I have to hit up the biggest EDM festival in the world, Tomorrowland. So they hold that in Belgium. Gonna pack my bags and take my ass over to Belgium in July. And I did a little bit of research. I don't know if it's gonna go down for sure, but Ultra Music Festival, I did go to in Miami, but in September, they also have it in Japan. So yeah, turn it up with the Japanese ravers. Okay, let's send it. <laughs> if not, then I'll go to Electric Zoo. Uh, as long as Insomniac's running it, Insomniac's like the main, is it company that produces all of these festivals? Like they're in charge of like arranging the whole experience. Yeah, last Electric Zoo I heard was a shit show because people were waiting in line for hours. Like it was not a smooth flow of the crowd, like being able to attend the festival. So they better fix that. But if they do, I'll see you at maybe Ultra Japan and Electric Zoo. Who knows? But either way, I'll see you there. To wrap it up, one that I've been wanting to go to, I wanted to scoot it in this year, but I'm too focused on saving money. I'm very conservative with my finances this year. We're going to manifest it into next year. But holy shipwrecked, it's a music festival in Mexico. They have it at an all-inclusive resort. So the turn up is real. (laughs) Yeah, um, that would be my lineup of festivals in my third year of uh, five years left in life. Sounds lit. If anything, I shouldn't even wait till I get to that point. I should just do it. I should just follow through with this lineup next year. (laughs) Why not? I actually know somebody who just goes around the world and attends music festivals. So lucky him. (laughs) But who says that I can't do it myself either? I just got to find a way. Stay tuned with that. Anyways, let's get back to the question. That was three years. Two year mark, I'm probably gonna quit working and do whatever I want, whenever whenever I want. It'll probably be less events, but still a lot of travel. So I'm probably gonna hit up a bunch of countries. I'm gonna hit up some European countries, some in Asia, some in South America, and live there for like two to three months in each place. Why not? have a really slower pace of life and discover the world, basically. That would be a lit number two left years of life. And the last year, the last year I'm going to sit my ass home. The last year I'm just going to keep it chill. For the first six months, I'm going to just focus on my hobbies. Um, Right now, I would want to continue my current hobbies of learning how to DJ because I would I personally think that my music selection is A1, (laughs) discern, and so yeah, working on mixing music, and I also love to garden, growing my own food, still living a healthy lifestyle through those means, probably, and also woodworking would be cool too. I would like to build my own furniture, that'd be dope, because interior design is also super interesting to me. 
and I have plans to actually like switch things up in this room. I sleep in my brother's room currently and there's just a bunch of stuff on our bookshelf that is like old so I'm gonna pack it up into boxes and uh, condense things to have a good, good idea of like what I want to add. It's probably going to be more little pots and plants, um, things hanging from the ceiling. That's my vibe. So yeah, um, I'll probably update on that in the next episode. So we'll see where that goes. And also I was like, you know what? I'm going to plan my funeral. I'm going to plan my funeral. When I was writing this down to answer these questions on my little outline, I was like, why is it that planning my funeral sounds way more fun than planning a wedding? <laughs> I'm like dead ass serious because I've never wanted to plan a wedding. It just doesn't spark joy for me. I don't even know if I want to get married. Like, yeah, uh-huh. I probably have to sit on that a little bit further, <laughs> but as of right now, in my gut, I'm just like, I don't understand the hype of weddings for me, for me, like, uh, I'm fine with eloping, I guess, but there's a, there's a lot of convincing to do and able to get to that point for me personally, but, but if I had five years left to live, I'm like so excited about who I'm going to invite to my funeral because it's not a sad thing. It's like a celebration of everything that I've done, everything that I'm about, what people love me for. So it's going to be super fun when I die. <laughs> Everybody's invited to come eat good food, turn up, play games. There's going to be a basketball court. There is going to be badminton. There's going to be giant Jenga. There's going to be music. There's going to be dancing. And you're invited to my funeral. Oh, <laughs> that's how I want it to be. And who says that that can't go down, you know? So, yeah, stay tuned for <laughs> future funeral plans. It's going to be a music festival. Yeah, that's going to be the theme. Okay, back to the question. The last six months of my life will be very, very mellow. We started off strong. We peaked at the music festival lineup, but these last six months will be very chill. It's going to be probably me just like, you know, chilling at home. Um, hopefully my mom and dad are still going to be with me. I'll probably take some psychedelics, you know? I'm probably just going to sit on my thoughts and continue to be curious about what's next in my life and just be excited, really be excited about seeing my grandma again, about seeing those who have left this physical life sooner than I thought that they would because on, on top of my grandma, I also lost a friend recently too. He was involved in a motorcycle accident and I was like, super sudden um yeah yeah death is freaking crazy for sure it makes me look at life in a whole new different way when somebody close to you is not there anymore um but you know just kind of shouting out this friend i do feel whole in a sense that we kind of like had a connection with each other like a more intimate connection and when it comes to coming across people that get to that level with me, I have more experiences of becoming like disappointed after things don't work out because I'm like, bro, this person never really deserved my love. And with the passing of this person, I feel the opposite. This person is deserving of my love yeah, like death is a really tricky thing, but there's ways to go around it to make it a better experience and there's a lot to learn from it. So yeah, um, last six months, very chill, becoming curious and excited about what's next to come and seeing those loved ones that have left my life already. So now we have the fifth and final question. Why do we throw away food when we know that people are dying of hunger? I think that there's many ways to approach this question, but how I look at it is like, 
It depends on your geographic location. It depends on just what country you live in, because in reality, there's still so many underdeveloped countries where people are living to just have food. And for me, I think that I can only speak on my experience living in the United States, because realistically, it's not that hard to go get food. You know, you can just panhandle, maybe get like five bucks out of somebody and get you a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread and some water will probably last you a few days. So is it really that hard? Are you really going to die of hunger? I know there's probably people who are dying of hunger, but it's not as hard as it is in the States compared to places where food is not accessible. So if you're a decent human being and you're aware of your blessings, you probably had this guilt before when you throw away food and you're just like, bro, somebody can really use this food right now because they're so hungry. So coming from like the perspective of a more developed country, such as the US, the reason why we throw food away is because of public policy dealing with foodborne illnesses. Because the US has an enormous population and if people are just distributing, they're eating, and cooking whatever food, handing it out, that could really cause issues from a legal perspective. You know what I'm saying? Like the lawsuits that would spike dealing with this concern of an outbreak, I don't think that we can even like manage it, honestly. Just because people are so quick to sue, if there's any opportunity for somebody to make money off of a lawsuit, if we don't regulate food, people would like capitalize on that. People would use that to their advantage and just sue everybody for getting them sick. So I think it has to do with picking the less of two evils. You know, like one, you feed everybody, everybody gets fed anytime. It doesn't matter where it's coming from, but you have an increased spike in litigation And that's a headache in itself just because lawsuits take a hella long time and it impacts the system from a legislative point down to the individual. So that's a lot going on. But on the other part, people are not getting fed like they are dying of hunger potentially, but you lower the chances of having that probability of an outbreak going around. And I think that the system declares that the outbreak is a worse consequence. So yeah, we got to throw away that unused food just because people will sue you for getting them sick. And uh, yeah, that's my answer to this question. All right, guys, I will be wrapping it up now. Thank you for tuning in with me in this episode. I hope that there are some things that made you think like, hmm, interesting how do I feel about that? So yeah, it would be cool if you give me a five stars rating. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, because I am on Spotify and also Google Podcasts. I'm trying to get on Apple Podcasts, but they are denying me access for not activating my account. But I, I have to probably hit up their customer service. But anyways, Spotify, Google Podcasts, I'm there. I'm your girl for five stars. If you're listening slash watching this on YouTube, you know the drill. If you mess with me, like it, subscribe, and leave any comments if you thought that any of the questions I asked and answered were interesting. When do you think that it's like a right time to say I love you? You know what I'm saying? But yes, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you guys next week. Woo, 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 woo.